So Fiona McCann is a professor of post-colonial literatures at the University of Lille in France and current director of the interdisciplinary research center Cécile. She has published numerous articles and book chapters on trauma and violence in contemporary Zimbabwe and South African and Irish literature, um, a monograph on Northern Irish writing after the Troubles, and has edited a collection of essays on the Khosrow regime in Ireland. Her current research projects involve a short, a short book on decolonial pedagogies of care and a longer book on poetics and ecologies of care in 21st century Irish writing. Today, Fiona will be talking about Jan Carson's fiction and the politics of care. Right, I too would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, everybody for the stimulating conversations that we've had all day. I'm also aware it's getting to that point in the day where everybody's exhausted and I have to apologize, I don't have a PowerPoint. By the way, hear my accent, it's gonna be power um, because I had a technical glitch. So apologies and I'll try and make it as lively as possible. Um, so. It might come as a surprise to some people here to think of the north of Ireland and the question of care together. After all, outside of those six wee counties shared or torn between Britain and the south of Ireland, most people even today tend to associate this place with a long and bloody conflict, a peace process fraught with tensions, that's an understatement, an absolute political disaster in terms of governance, that is also an understatement. And more recently, the threat of violence waiting to erupt again. In other words, a society about as far removed from mutual care as it's possible to get. Now, while not wanting to deny that uh, all that I've just mentioned is true, um, and that there are certainly reasons to be sceptical about our ability to care in Northern Ireland, I would like to bring to the fore another image of this place. Um, far from the media images and documentaries with which uh, we're all very familiar and which tend often to entrench a polarized vision. So the alternative vision that I would like to bring th to the debate today is that of local communities in which care practices are central because of rather than in spite of our charged and violent past. Now, anyone who spent any time in the North will already know this. And for those of you who don't, well, we're lucky enough to have an impressive number of cultural ambassadors who, in their art, music, performances and literary works, convey this aspect of Northern Irishness with humour, poignancy and great originality. Jan Carson is one of the foremost cultural ambassadors who we have, and her residence, I think, here in Nancy testifies to this. And along with a whole list of other authors, and, and Jan projected a... Um, an image of a number of them earlier on, and it's a list far too long for me to go into, but along with, with these other writers, um, I think that in both her fiction and in her community arts engagement, uh, she offers us a politics and a poetics of care. So first of all, what is care? Well, feminist scholars and activists in particular have been thinking about care for quite a long time now, and it has been increasingly generating more and more scholarly interest over the past few years, partly it must be said, in response to the ravages of neoliberal and neo-colonial policies across the globe, and of course, in the face of total climate disaster. Feminist Joan Tronto, in her foundational work, Moral Boundaries, A Political Argument for an Ethic of Care, that was published in 1993, so almost 30 years ago, was already pointing out what for her were the limits of empathy. She says, and I quote, the problem is that there's no way to guarantee that in taking the place of the other, as if in a game of musical moral chairs, the moral actor will recognize all of the relevant dimensions of the other's situation, end of quote. So Tronto advocates for the development of an ethic of care instead. And although she doesn't contest the notion of empathy, she instead focuses her efforts on determining what she calls, I quote, the universal principles about the need for care without which we will not be able to understand how well care is accomplished in the process of realizing it." End of quote. So care for Toronto is above all a political idea. And she says, I quote her again, only if we understand care as a political idea, will we be able to change its status and the status of those who do caring work in our culture. 
And to this end, she attempts to provoke a paradigm shift, which involves understanding care in the following way. And this quotation, um, I just think it's the best definition of care there is. Uh, I quote, a species activity that includes everything we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web." Unquote. Now, other thinkers have, have contributed uh, to this debate, and I'm not going to mention them all, but I will mention quite recently a, a group called The Care Collective, um, based in Britain, published just last year, The Care Manifesto, very short book, very interesting, in which they set out nothing less than a progressive vision of the world that takes the idea of care seriously in order to move towards the cultivation of a caring politics, fulfilling lives, and a sustainable world. And they are careful to, uh, to emphasize in this book that it is, I quote, only by confronting the past and prioritizing the needs of those who have been most marginalized, violated, and negated by uncaring nation states, will we be able to move forward into a juster future and cultivate a radically different way of relating to others and the world itself, unquote. Well, hopefully everyone in this room can see how strongly this manifesto resonates with the situation in the north of Ireland. Now, notwithstanding Tronto's wariness of the term, empathy is, I think, nevertheless related to care. And as Charlotte Silke and Bernardine Brady have recently pointed out, I quote, true empathy involves being able to imagine how others feel in their shoes rather than thinking about how you would feel if you were in those shoes, unquote. And they are responding to um, detractors, really, of the ways in which uh, empathy or people who have criticised empathy for leading to the establishment of fake assumptions, almost as though empathy is almost neo-colonial um, in, in, in some ways, um, and, and the ways in which that can sometimes lead to the establishment of what Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie would call a single story. So for Tammy Amiel Hauser and Adia Mendelssohn Maos, um, for them, theories that advocate empathy lean on, and I'm quoting them here, the hypothesis of universe, the hypothesis of universality apparent in the assumption that readers share universal feelings and experiences with fictional characters and can thus replicate those characters' inner perspectives. Specifically, the reader is assumed to have a privileged position that transcends limiting historical and social conditions and allows her to enter the mind of the fictional character and to deeply understand that character's experience." Unquote. Now this is indeed a danger, but empathy, I think, can lead to the development of mutual forms of care. And even those authors who are against empathy, and that's the title of, of the, that article I was quoting there, Against Empathy, even these authors stress that ethical criticism must take into account the ethical demands that arise when we face a radical stranger, the other whose feelings and thoughts we cannot enter yet, who nonetheless demands responsiveness and responsibility from us." Unquote. Interestingly, uh, responsiveness, responsiveness and responsibility are two of the major tenets of care as Joan Tronto defines it. And to this end, and I promise this is the end of the theoretical overload, and you know, I'll get on to Jan's fiction in a moment. Um, but to this end, it's worth pointing out that in a very recently uh, published collection, Ianva, it's published just this year in 2022 and edited by Killian Murphy, uh, the actor. Um, well, Killian Murphy highlights in the introduction that if empathy is to have any function in our societies, then it must be predicated on connection. That is to say, truly listening and that it should be distinguished from sympathy. This is where fiction and the arts come in. And uh, Jan Carson has been involved for some time in working uh, with people with dementia, for example, and has been instrumental in encouraging and fostering change in literary representations of this illness, which are, uh, as she has pointed out, often full of cliches and inaccurate stereotypes. And in the introduction to the collection, which uh, she showed us this morning, in fact, um, so this uh, collection entitled A Little Unsteadily Into the Light, she addresses precisely this question of appropriation and the potentially, quote, crass appropriation of someone else's story, unquote, basically the question of legitimacy. And under uh, Jan Carson's uh, encouraging guidance, the pieces of fiction published in that collection, all in different ways, engage in a textual struggle to prevent the reader from excluding and marginalizing those who do not seem similar or understandable, 
and strive to represent forms of vulnerability and distress that elude conventional representation. So in what follows, I'd like to suggest that Jan Carson's fiction, and particularly her short fiction, engages in highly original ways with politics and poetics of care. This is not to say that this doesn't happen also in her novels, but um, I had actually planned to talk about the novels, but then when I looked at the programme, I saw that nobody was going to be talking about the short fiction. Um, and so in the interest of overall balance, uh, I've taken that as my main point of focus. And time constraints really won't let me do justice to the stories. Um, so I'll skim over a few and then focus uh, home in on, on one story. Um, so many of the stories in um, Jan's debut collection, Children's Children, published in 2016, although they in many cases have atemporal settings, appear to deal with the generation after the Troubles and are concerned with vulnerability and care. For example, the title and final story is a fable about a divided island which is suffering from such a population drop because of emigration and climate change that the very survival of the islanders is threatened. A young man and a young woman, one from the north and one from the south, who have been chosen to marry each other and have children, meet for the first time at the border. Now, the ending of this story is inconclusive and it's ultimately unclear whether they will manage to, I quote, love the island enough to be neither north nor south, foreigner or familiar, but rather a brave new direction balanced like a hairline fracture in the centre of everything, unquote. The balanced syntax here, reinforced by the alliterative F, foreign, familiar, and the vague echo of the brave new world, dear both to Shakespeare's naive Miranda, but also to Huxley's dystopian vision, convey mixed meanings about what the future might indeed hold. And the final image of a hairline fracture eschews a fairy tale ending of reconciliation and instead acknowledges the results of accumulated trauma. All the more so as the future is described as, I quote, sneaking out like a stifled fart, unquote. And I think uh, Jan Carson's playful irre irre irreverence here uh, accompanies rather than masks a not so obvious engagement with care. If the image of the released fart points to the potentially explosive, sorry, explosive impossibility of keeping things in, it also gestures, I think, to the malodorous or toxic fallout from too much retention. Although the two protagonists have no other choice but to marry and repopulate, thereby not only preserving the population of the island, but also upholding the heteropatriarchal status quo, which in fact, as an aside, suggests that both sides of the border have more in common than they care to admit. They also, these two characters, also perform small acts of care for each other that can only be seen as so many leaps of faith. She offers him a ham sandwich, smothered in mayonnaise, uh, which she has prepared for him and which he eats in spite of the fact that it nearly makes him vomit or should I say bulk, <laughs> while the way he eats, so the very manner in which he masticates, provokes the same reaction in her. Both, nevertheless, dissimulate their disgust in order to prevent hurting the other, and this leads them to be able to engage in more meaningful exchanges. Their final enthusiasm for each other and the marriage plot is tempered only by the realisation that if one or other moves to the other side of the border, the fragile balance on the island will upset, and it will tip over into the sea. Now, I think here what's foregrounded is the power of rumour also in entrenching the fear of alterity throughout the story. And by setting this fable against the backdrop of climate catastrophe, what's highlighted is a multi-scalar reflection on care. Too obsessed with their rivalry, the islanders do not really care about the greater existential threat, comically evoked in the description of, I quote, a half mile of the coast, that had unhooked itself and floated off to Lanzarote or some other sunny place. No one had noticed or particularly cared, for the peripheral directions had remained unimportant so long as north had stayed north and south had continued to dominate the southern extremities." Unquote. Now behind the comic, and indeed highly ironic, personification of parts of the island breaking away in search of a hotter climate, lies a gentle indictment of the misplaced cursor of care, what we should be caring about and the unfair responsibility and exhortation to find a solution placed on the shoulders of the younger generation. Now, in the same collection, the more magical realist Floater deals with, uh, so that's the title of the short story, deals with ambivalent maternity and single motherhood in an innovative way 
and raises somewhat uncomfortable questions about the caregiving role allotted primarily to women, especially in relation to children. This story, poised exquisitely between humour and poignancy, is narrated by the young mother of a daughter conceived in an airplane toilet with a middle-aged stranger. The six-year-old daughter is not bound by the rules of gravity and is tied down by a ribbon, but the mother finally snips the ribbon, letting her daughter drift off into the sky and into the atmosphere. Sorry for the spoiler. Much of the story is in fact addressed to the daughter as the mother becomes more and more tempted by the idea of severing the ribbon, or should we say cord, and although there is an evident care relationship between the mother and daughter, the final sentence delivers a scathing criticism of the ease with which men walk away, heterosexual men, walk away from unplanned pregnancies. I quote, do not blame me, do not blame yourself. Blame the airport bathroom and your father, who was only there for the easy part, unquote. So this story comically figures the fallacy of the no-strings-attached uh, sexual flings for men only, sometimes is this the case for women, and yet it also interrogates the mechanisms of maternal empathy and care in innovative ways. Poignantly, the anguish of the young mother who wishes to be freed of the burden of this floating child and of motherhood, uh, well, this this need um, dovetails with her need to care for herself and also the need to relinquish care for this buoyant daughter. So as these far too brief uh, readings uh, suggest of these uh, earlier stories, um, all of the stories, in fact, in this collection are extraordinarily original in their take on contemporary divisions in the North and on the forms of care which emanate from such a particular context, even when, as is the case in many of these stories, the context is in fact unspecified. The focus on the intimate sphere, on the everyday acts of sharing and division that permeate our lives, deftly brings individual vulnerabilities to the fore. And in this, uh, I would say that there are somewhat dissensual narratives, very far from the hackneyed conflict-related cliches which have sometimes dominated uh, Northern fiction, um, because these stories, I think, render the banalities of the quotidian in a rather extraordinary way. Now, the most recent short story collection, The Last Resort, even though it is set in a more easily recognisable post-conflict Northern Ireland, still bears all the hallmarks of what some critics have termed magical realism, and we've talked a lot about this already uh, today. But it also, I will argue, posits empathy and care as central to any resolution of our violent past and tension-filled present. A series of ten interlocking stories, so it's a short story cycle, each narrated by a different character staying at a caravan park situated on a cliff edge on the north coast. The north coast of the north of Ireland, that is. Uh, the Last Resort is a poignant and often very funny reflection on the difficulty of letting go of the past and of accepting the present. All of the characters have lost something, or someone, from a daughter. So Frankie's daughter was killed in a sectarian attack. Some have lost a homeland, Vidas, has left his native Lithuania behind. One woman has lost the heteropatriarchal ideal, Kathleen, who has great difficulty accepting her daughter's homosexuality. And one character has lost his life partner, because John's wife, Martha, has dementia. And when Martha goes missing in the middle of the night, and John, somewhat embarrassed, raises the alert, he notes, I quote, People are awful kind, even strangers. You don't realise how kind they are until you're in the middle of a crisis, unquote. In fact, in spite of the inevitable tensions one might expect on a caravan site, exacerbated in this case by a series of thefts, kindness is the prevailing mode of interaction among the various characters, and several acts of care are carried out in the course of the stories. Yet, and I think this is interesting, Jan Carson is also careful to place this care and kindness alongside anger, fear and frustration. It's not all kumbaya. And when in the final story it becomes clear that it is Frankie's dead daughter, Lynette, who is behind all the missing objects, well, she's quick to reveal, Lynette this is, that her motivation has been less about helping them and more about, I quote, messing with people's heads, unquote. It is, in fact, anger which enables her to perform the greatest act of care, that of screaming so wildly that all the characters, so desperate to get their stolen things back, that they are ignoring poor Martha, right, who's with her dementia perched perilously on the edge of the cliff about to fall, and they're all holding onto the caravan, right, which is also about to fall because they want their things, 
Um, and, and this scream, this kind of um, primeval scream, which uh, Lynette uh, releases, forces them to let go, to let go literal, literally of the material objects and figuratively of their individual traumas. The final paragraphs are saturated with lexical variations on anger and its vehement expression, rage, fury, rush, cracks, splits, howl, screaming, and others, all of which highlight the ways in which even violent affect and unprocessed trauma can be channeled into acts of care. Lynette's angry, urgent, and wild nonverbal communication, bridging the gap between death and life, past and present, is a compelling manifestation of unorthodox care practices and their powerful potential for unleashing a better future. Now, for the few minutes that I have left, I would like to turn to Jan Carson's most recently published short story um, in the aforementioned collection on dementia-inspired fictions. And the short story is entitled Our Dear Ladies Have Outnumbered Us. And I've included it not just because it's one of my favourites, full disclosure, um, but also because it foregrounds the multiple layers at play in the field of care. Firstly, the story is set in a care centre, uh, a sort of facility for women with dementia who have manageable enough symptoms. And it's narrated by one, or in fact, perhaps several, it's kind of a collective voice, of the institutional carers. The story begins with the unexpected arrival of Angelica, a new patient who proves to be much less angelic and malleable than the other women and who upsets the fine equilibrium in place up until that point. The equilibrium is six ladies and six carers. The story begins with the description of a daily walk of the highly circumscribed, uh, sorry, begins with the description of a daily walk and of the highly circumscribed options available to. Behind a veneer of respect encoded into the term our dear ladies, employed throughout, it gradually becomes clear that the carers, while ostensibly responding to these women's needs, are actually in the business of disempowering them while shoring up their own authority. This is not to say that they do not meet the women's needs, and indeed there is ample evidence that they do, even, in fact, that they are sometimes able to improvise in order to do so, as when, for example, the dear ladies collectively ask for breakfast at dinner time and they go along with it. That there is a slight discrepancy between the way in which the daily routine plays out and how it is told is suggested from the outset of the story when the narrator states that, I quote, we walk in a different direction every day. There are only two directions available. And that second sentence reveals that although the first one is not entirely untrue, it is nevertheless only a partial vision of the truth. And these sentences, therefore, program, program, can't say it, programmatically set up the rest of the story. And this discrepancy between partial truths and a more prosaic reality is pursued in the tension between the ever so slightly, almost imperceptibly, condescending attitude the carers display towards their ladies and how they actually engage with them. And indeed, in the very use of that word itself, a lady is defined as a woman of high social position or economic class, or a woman who is refined, polite, and well-spoken. Here, that term might be read in two ways, either as a means of endowing these women suffering from dementia with dignity, elevating them, or as a means of underscoring the contrast between these connotations of what a lady is and the ways in which these women's behavior deviates from that norm. I've said either or, but in fact, perhaps these different understandings are not necessarily mutually exclusive. A discrepancy is also apparent in the tension between the varied enumerations of what the ladies are forbidden to do and the freedom which seemingly defines the care role. I quote, we let them make their own selections. This is when they're in the sweet shop. We let them make their own selections. It's important to preserve a sense of independence. Obviously, we observe. Or a little bit later on, we can take our ladies out whenever we like. So I think the power differential is exposed here through the choice of the verb let, the extremely limited agency attributed to the women, and the almost sinister observing of the carers. Finally, the initial implication that the carers take pleasure in preparing different suits, soups, sorry, for the for 
all of the different uh, women, I quote, we don't mind making different soups if it keeps our ladies happy. We prepare three different kinds. Well, these statements are immediately de debunked by the following one. It's just a matter of opening tins. So it in fact becomes increasingly apparent that the narrators are repulsed by the women who are described in a somewhat grotesque manner. Dot's, quote, mouth is gaping and cavernous. Her slabbers leave unsightly remarks, unquote. Molly's food theft, theft sorry, um, a quote, squishes and sours and leaves a stain, unquote. When the women become too difficult, the narrator explains that they are moved to the other place. And the capitalization of those words, capital O, capital P, confers a somewhat ominous status onto it. The humor in the story partially stems from the reversal of the power differential. Angelica directing a mutiny of sorts, and we are led to believe ousting Dot, leaving the narrator or narrators in the final sentence to announce with some fear that although the balance has ostensibly been restored, I quote, our dear ladies have outnumbered us, unquote. But lest this seem like a story about the ironically named rebel rousing Angelica, whose intentions and agency remain somewhat slippery throughout the story, it is, I think, important to bear in mind the subtextual reflection on care politics. As Joan Tronto points out, I quote, in our present culture, there is a great ideological advantage to gain from keeping care from coming into focus. By not noticing how pervasive and central care is to human life, those who are in positions of power and privilege can continue to ignore and to degrade the activities of care and those who give care, unquote. It is precisely because care has become commodifiable, we now pay for it, we outsource it, as it were, it's because of this that it has become removed from its four tenets, as Tronto has defined them, caring about, taking care of, caregiving, and care receiving. The narrator and her acolytes here do take care of their wards, but only providing the minimum and always maintaining control. Their actions are not so much about caregiving, uh, or e at least if there is caregiving, it's only really on the carer's terms. What Angelica's arrival does, above all, is shift the status of vulnerable from the cared for to the carers, whose power and authority are now in jeopardy. And this, I think, too, is a nice reversal of the all too hackneyed cliches concerning people in care, from whom very often we, we eliminate any agency. Angelica perturbs the institutionalized behaviors of the women and restores some degree of agency for them. Although the twist in the tale is of course that she appears to take a Machiavellian pleasure in asserting her own authority. So this presentation has uh, really not been able at all to address the complexity of uh, Jan Carson's engagement with the, the poetics of care and has necessarily been a very kind of brief overview. Um, but what I would say is that this poetics of care, uh, it, you know, is, is a strong engagement which extends uh, to her community arts activism and also the kind of generosity which we saw this morning as she shared details of her own writing process. If it were possible to transfer this kind of care and generosity to Stormont and the political sphere, the north of Ireland would be in a better place. Maybe more of them should read Jan's fiction. Thank you. Thank you.